All right. OK, hello, everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Yoni Friedman, and I'm the product manager for Amazon Translate, our fully managed, continuously trained neural machine translation service that we had just announced as generally available earlier this morning. Um, so we'll start with Amazon Translate. We'll transition to Amazon Transcribe in about 30 minutes. Um, so back to Translate, I would like to show you today how you can build multilingual applications with one API and just a few lines of code. So first, a bit of customer context. 55% of consumers buy only on websites in their own language. So if you're selling stuff, your reach is limited by the amount of languages that you're supporting. And this is critical. In the state of California, for example, over 40% of families speak a language that is not English at home. This notion is, of course, true uh, across the board. Customers want to communicate in their native language when they chat uh, with customer service, email their coworkers, write posts and blogs, and so on. And that is really the majority of digital content that until today has not been translated in most cases. Which means that if you want to maximize your addressable market, you need to localize your assets, which includes translation, of course, uh, but also adapting it to local dialects, your brand-specific style, language-specific morphology, and so on. The problem with that is that professional localization is a very, very manually intensive process with translators, project managers, QA folks, and so on. That means that you hire a localization firm that assigns at least a couple of professional translators per language pair that you need to get done. Folks with master's degrees that often have very domain-specific expertise, who in most cases deliver a really high-quality result. But high-quality human work is, naturally takes time. So the minimal turnaround time for most projects is, is several days. And the average cost for that job is 15 cents per, dollar, per, per word which is about $150 for your average news article. Multiply the amount of content that your business has by about 40 languages, which is give or take the amount of, of languages that can generate incremental revenue for your business, and you get a pretty hefty bill there. This makes professional localization an option that's viable only for your organization's most precious and valuable content. Think about your applications you are, your marketing content, uh, any type of regulatory filings, and so on. Now, the opportunity becomes clear when you realize that over half, 51% of consumers, actually prefer content in their own language, even if the language quality was not perfect. And the same applies to B2B. 51% of companies say that they'll buy software that supports other languages, even if the language is not perfect. Now, at Amazon, we've had the same problems over the years, and, and we've been using machine translation to solve them. We translate hundreds of billions of words every year, and that has been growing exponentially. Um, so machine translation has been basically key, a key enabler to our international expansion. We use machine translation to translate product listings and reviews, search queries, website strings, functional content, communications with customer support, communications with vendors and sellers, product documentation, and a lot more. Now, until 2017, we ran these machine translation uh, uh, services on phrase-based, or also known as statistical machine translation engines, which basically enabled us to make a lot of content that we couldn't have otherwise uh, available in, in many languages, but the quality was still quite limiting. We couldn't really use it. Uh, for a lot of applications. And many of you have probably seen embarrassing machine translations, kind of like this one here, in the past. Then, over the last year, we had productized proprietary state-of-the-art neural machine translation engines. And that was a leap ahead for us in terms of quality, um, in terms of both current performance as well as the prospect of what we can do with it. Now, let me explain. In essence, statistical engines, which are the ones that we used to have, 
are basically a fancy lookup algorithm that makes decisions based on the probability of a certain word mapping in, in the source language, mapping to the word, to, to a different word in the target language. The problem with these statistical models is that predominantly uh, they don't understand context and they're really limited to around, give or take, five words around the word that they're currently doing. But that's no longer the case with neural engines. I'm extremely oversimplifying this, but generally speaking, neural engines um, are built such that they mimic the way, they're inspired by the way that the human brain learns and processes information. And that means a ton in terms of performance. They understand quality, they, they understand context, they understand the focus of the sentence, and they understand morphology. Now let's take a look at an example. This is the Wenger Swiss Officer's Giant Knife on Amazon.de, personally one of my favorite products that I've ever seen on Amazon. Um, mind you, it has, one, uh, it has 87 tools, and it offers 141 functions, and that's guaranteed, so it's a pretty serious tool that we're looking at here. It also turns out that one of these tools is a toothpick. And here you can see what a customer in Germany uh, wrote about their experience with it. Now here's how one well-known open source engine that still uses statistical engines uh, would have translated this. Let me read that out loud for, to really leave an impression. Um, really very good pocket knife. Had yesterday after breakfast something poppy hang between the teeth. Because I once again found no toothpicks, I ordered mine without further ado, this pocket knife. The integrated toothpick NUR3 is very stable and very quickly I could clean my teeth. Super, to the rest I can tell nothing unfortunately because I him not be emergency. So, you know, the reader can kind of get the gist of the message here, but overall, not that great and we wouldn't want to surface that translation. Now let's take a look at what our current neural engines do. Really a very good pocket knife. Had a little poppy between the teeth yesterday after breakfast. Since I didn't find a toothpick again, I ordered this pocket knife shortly. The integrated toothpick number three is very stable and I could clean my teeth very quickly. Great, I can't say anything about the rest because I don't need it. Now as you can see, we still have some work to do here, but this is much closer to the way that a human would have actually translated this phrase, uh, this paragraph. And the meta point I wanna make with this example here is that our engines have gone from producing results that kinda get the reader uh, the gist of the original message to a point where they're much closer to proper human language and are therefore tools that we can leverage for many more use cases. And this is evident if we quantify it too. So the dotted line that you're seeing there um, symbolizes our first experiments with neural architecture in July 2015. Everything before that was statistical engines. Now as you can see, uh, at first we saw a bit of a dip in translation quality uh, because frankly there weren't many people that fully understood how neural networks worked at the time. Um, but then we see that um, the, our performance really started to pick up the pace and we really left the, stati the st statistical engines uh, far behind. Now, for context, we're looking at blue score. The, the y-axis there is the blue score. Um, without getting into too many details, this is the, the vastly most used metric for evaluating machine translation. Before neural, scientists were celebrating at annual conventions that we have about machine translation uh, every half a point of progress per year. What we see here is 10 points in two and a half years. And that is really, really symbolizes and shows how our scientists have made progress uh, that is already improving in double digits the quality of, of, of translations, but also is showing an 8x improvement pace over what we had before. And these are two separate very important points to remember. Now, one of the most important contributors to success with Amazon Translate, to your success with Amazon Translate, is understanding where to apply the solution. Because we're not implying by any means that the progress that we've made has made this perfect and there's never a mistake. This is still a machine learning algorithm. State-of-the-art machine translation is a great tool for any kind of content that flows in really large volume. 
or is created and deprecated very quickly. So think about any kind of user content like reviews and posts, uh, communication between customers and employees. Those are all great candidates if you think about any type of content that your users create. Other situations where companies need to sift through large volumes of content, for example, to extract insights are also a great fit. So if you need to extract sentiment from um, a large amount of multilingual content, classify lots of documents, or search through them, Amazon Translate lets you do that quickly, accurately, and very cost effectively. And that is by far, like I mentioned, the vast majority of digital content that in most cases is still not translated uh, and has a really large opportunity for our customers. Now in other situations where uh, the this, this specific style of the content is critical, where you cannot allow for any mistake to be made in the translation, um, you can use machine translation to take a first pass at your content and then enable human translators, professional translators like I talked about at the beginning, uh, complete the job by focusing on the accuracy and the specific style they can, that your company requires. So again, think about your company's UI, marketing materials, regulatory filings, and so on. Now let's talk a little bit about what are uh, some, some actual examples of customers that are already using this service. So Hotels.com uh, is using Amazon Translate to translate customer property reviews before they run them through uh, their own heuristics, their own algorithms that, uh, that um, uh, digest them and basically get the meaning, get the sentiment of every review. Icentia, which is a media monitoring services, service for brands, is using it to make content in languages that it couldn't analyze for its customers in the past accessible to its algorithms, which are built in English. And PubNub, which offers real-time communication platforms like Chat Engine, for example, is enabling customers to build multilingual chat applications using Amazon Translate. So if that's something that your business needs, uh, you're, you're, you can use Chat Engine today with Amazon Translate. Next, I'd like to show a demo of translating real-time interpersonal communication. And in this application, Kashif, a solutions architect that works with, with the company Twitch, uh, built an app that translates Twitch channels in real time. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Kashif Imran, and I'm a senior solutions architect at AWS. This is a brief walkthrough of the app showing real-time translation of Twitch chat. Here you see I'm on a Twitch channel where streamer is playing game and live streaming it on the channel. You also see live chat on the right side of the screen. This is a German channel, so most of the communication happening here on the channel is obviously in German. I don't speak German, but this channel sounds interesting and I'm curious to know about the conversation happening on this channel. Let's see how we can get this real-time chat translated and understand the conversation happening on this channel. Let me copy the name of the channel and switch to the app. I'll paste the name of the channel. Select the source language. In this case, we'll choose German. Select the target language, which in this case, I'll choose English, and click Go. Live chat messages. And voila, we are connected to the channel. We're getting the real time messages on the left side of the screen, and the translation of those messages are on the right side of the screen. Let me go ahead and introduce myself to the channel. So if I type a message and hit send, you can see even though I typed the messages in English, it got translated in German. And if we switch back to the channel, you can see it's also posted in, in the channel uh, in German. Now, let's look at another channel with Twitch app and our translation app side by side. You see as messages are coming in the chat, they are instantly being translated and displayed in our translation app on the right side of the screen. Now, let's talk briefly about how the application is built. Here you can see the architecture of our app is quite simple. Our app uses a Node.js library to connect to Twitch chat and start receiving real-time messages. As those messages come in, we use AWS SDK to call Amazon Translate 
get the translated messages back and display them in the UI. If user enable the voice option, we then use AWS SDK to call Amazon Polly and get the synthesized speech back for those messages and then play them back to the user. Let's now dig a little bit deeper and look at the code to see how the application is built. Looking at the code, the app has two files, index.html and app.js. Index.html has all the necessary UI elements to get user input and show messages. App.js has less than 100 lines of code to get real-time messages from Twitch chat, get those messages translated, and then display on the UI. As you can see, we'll begin with some initialization code to wire up the UI. Then we have on chat function, which gets called when the messages arrive. We then call Amazon Translate to get those messages translated and display in the UI. As you can see, more than half of the code here is to wire up UI elements and getting and setting values for those elements. Whereas the code to translate the messages are only few lines of code. In this case, I used Twitch chat as one of the source for real-time message translations using Amazon Translate. It can easily be applied to many other real-time streaming text scenarios like other chat platforms, customer service interactions, message boards, and more. All right, so uh, this is really a very powerful tool for adoption and retention. Um, for everyone here, uh, Note that this code sample, the, the, this, the code from this example and many others are all in the Amazon Translate code samples page, so check it out. We've also published a, a blog post, if I'm not mistaken, about, about this specific implementation. All right, um, now as we mentioned before, Amazon Translate is also a very useful tool to, for translators. And next, I'd like to invite to the stage Eduardo D'Antonio, who is a director of globalization at VMware, and Ken Watson, the CTO of LionBridge, to talk about how LionBridge leveraged Amazon Translate to serve VMware more efficiently. Great, thanks. Great presentation, by the way. Uh, very interesting. For technology companies like VMware, uh, we really need something like that. Um, so here's uh, a little bit about some of your VMware needs on localization and translation. Uh, if you get a sample of 20 million words, web content, field enablement, education, a combination of highly technical materials that goes to professional server systems engineers, uh, that has cutting edge, uh, disruptive technology that sometimes is not even available in the market yet, so there's not a large population of not even human translators who understand it becomes highly complex to find the domain expertise, like you mentioned, that would be able to translate that, even though understand the technology itself. Um, and then we also have a large combination of language. So that creates a very challenging uh, human resource for us to deal with. Uh, scheduling, resource planning. At one given point, for example, we would need three or 400 uh, linguists working for us uh, full time. And so what we normally do is we don't go and hire those translators directly, we engage with a strategic partner like Lionbridge, and we outsource the translation part to Lionbridge, and they manage that. Uh, and we've been doing this manually. We spend millions and millions of dollars every year with translation, so it's, it's not our core business. If we would spend that money in R&D, for example, in development or, or, or improving products, would be a much better use of the dollars, but we need to because over half of, uh, over five, 56, 60% revenue come from overseas, so we do need content in different language to be able to sell and support our customers. Um, and expanding on some of the, the points that I read, take the, the quality needs to be very high. So it's a con content that will go on the website, content that will go to customers, uh, a lot of technical material on how to install the product, how to support the product, how to maintain the product. So the quality needs to be high. Um, we need to scale the resource up and down very fast, so it's challenging because a product launch uh, varies from time to time, so it's don't need those resources constantly. Um, we need to maintain consistency. It's very difficult when you have hundreds and hundreds of translators at the same time touching translation content, how we maintain terminology and, and the content being cons consistent also from one version to another. 
And then the cost. The cost keeps going up and up and up. And so one of the solutions that we found, and I'll turn it over to our strategic partner, Lionbridge, to continue with the presentation. I'll be back at the end. Is the neural machine translation technology from Amazon. Awesome. Thanks, Eduardo. Hi, I'm Ken Watson. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at uh, Lionbridge. Uh, so we're the, the leader in this multi-billion dollar um, translation and localization business. We create and translate and manage, as we heard from Eduardo, the, the global digital content and communication for many customers across the world. We um, we have actually an enviable Rolodex of clients and, they, and many premium brands like VMware who really rely on us and have worked with us for many years. And they, 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 they work with us through this crowd in the cloud scenario. So we have hundreds, 100,000 plus professional translators in our community and we bring them together and, and apply them to, to the needs of our customers. At Lionbridge, we're known for the scale and quality of the way that we, 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 uh, we deploy our, our translators. And I'm excited to share with you how we partner with Amazon and worked with our, and worked with our, our, our client, uh, VMware, to deliver these translations. All right, so if you think about it, there are really several steps involved in delivering high quality human translation. As we saw from Yoni's slide earlier on, um, there are many cases where machine translation is the perfect fit for purpose. However, if we want to target and ensure human translation quality, um, we're going to need a different step, and that would take the machine translation first, and we complement it with a human step we call post-editing. So this approach, machine translation plus post-editing, really kind of supercharges the translator, allows them to, uh, to be much more efficient and much more effective in doing their job. So instead of having to start the translation from scratch, they will post-edit the MT output that comes from the, uh, from the MT engine and adapt it to make sure we've got the right tone and the right style for the target audience. So this is key. A good MT engine will take care of all the, all the terminology and all the, the basic translation and getting the words across. Um, and then what we need is the, the uh, but and that part of it is actually fairly uh, labor and thought intensive. And that's the bit the machine's really good at. Then what that allows us to do is reduce the scope of what the human translator is doing and have them focus just on the bits which uh, dr convey the right tone and the right, em uh, the right emotion into the message. So at Lionbridge, we really believe that all content should be made available in the, in the target language for the target audience. And so in this kind of post, uh, in this MT enabled world where it's readily available, we really get to triage the content and make sure we're picking the right ones for MT and the right ones for, uh, for, for, uh, for post editing. It's really quite exciting. If you can imagine a world where uh, we can uh, do, basically transfer, transform and translate everything that comes in the way of content and really just based on the importance or the risk or, or, the, uh, uh, or the value of that, the content, pick the ones that will have a little bit of human interaction through this post-editing process. So our goal in this pilot with VMware was to put Amazon Translate through a real-life production process for translating high-quality marketing-related content. For the pilot, VMware selected two white papers and we translated them into German and simple, uh, sim simplified Chinese. And the volumes that we had were good enough for us to really get a good, a good assessment for the productivity gains that we could, we could, uh, we could expect. I mean, what we were shooting for in the end result was that we should have no noticeable difference with regular translations, and we should meet the same high quality bar that VMware expects from us when we do regular translation. So of course we used the output we got from Amazon's neural machine translation engine to give our translators the, the, the head start. And at the end of the process, VMware managed the, uh, measured the quality and we me me measured the productivity through a, a process uh, you know, as compared to regular human translation. So for that measurement, we used a concept called edit distance. So edit distance uh, really measures the amount of extra effort uh, the, the post editor needs to put into the machine translated words. All right, now, in terms of the results, I'll hand back to Eduardo to tell us how we did. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, yes, yeah, continue on, on what Ken was saying. Uh, we are tasked to run a pilot that would reproduce a real-life translation project for us. And this is what we found out. Um, 
first, we're very impressed with the results. We have a very uh, rigorous quality control team uh, in all the regions, uh, and those are employees, those are people from VMware, and, and some of them dedicated to just review translated content and make sure that it meets the translation quality. Uh, there's a lot of tools and systems and process to review the quality, and, and it's a pass and fail, usually for VMware, to go to markets 99.3% in terms of errors. If you find more than one or two errors per thousand words, it's rejected and goes back for another human translator to edit and improve. So having a result like that from a machine translation uh, using Nero is very impressive for a company like VMware to see how scalable we can be. For example, a product, we can spend $200,000, $250,000 on a single project at VMware in the last three, four months using human translation. So the time to market and the savings could be really impactful for us. And so the, it was very fluent, uh, the translation, uh, similar to what a human translator would be. If you just read it quick, you wouldn't find out that it was translated by a, by a machine translation, which the statistical problem is it would be quite easily identified. This is done by a machine, not a human. In this case, it's match the, the human translatable material pretty high. Almost no linguistic grammatical errors. That was another problem that is, it, it solves from the statistical. It was full of grammatical errors. Uh, low rate of high severity errors, uh, sometimes better than human and better than other systems in the market, NMT, and 30% more efficient than human translations alone. Because with humans, if you think of it, it's translated, added proof. So there's three people touching it, and then a final review. So there's four humans touching it. And that shows the, the, the human, that graphic over there shows the human translation and the MT plus post editing. It reached a level that is very close, even for a tech, and, and the, more, the, the other thing that is impressive about it is it's the early days of the neural machine technology in general, and it's already providing that level of output. So it will pretty much see in the near future that it will translate just like the same way, way as a as human, and so it will be a big productivity enhancement for us working with Lion Bridge to use Amazon Translate um, because then I hand off the content to Amazon, to Lion Bridge. They use Amazon Translate and the time to market for us is going to be much faster and the cost is going to be much lower and we're going to scale. So that all three things combined become very powerful and very impactful for technology companies. And most of, it's not just technology companies, but there are a lot of other companies that requires a lot of translation and translation quality and, and large volume. So that is why this is compelling and, and very interesting for us in the globalization industry. Thanks, Eduardo. Thank you. Thank you. It's really by far the best part of our work to see what customers actually built with us. So this is super humbling and exciting. Um, Let's talk quickly about some of the features that you have at your disposal right now. Um, so you can translate between 12 language pairs, English to Arabic, simplified Chinese, French, German, Spanish, and Portuguese, and vice versa. The engines take plain text as input. They translate about a sentence in less than 500 milliseconds. Uh, that's the average service latency. And when the source language is not passed as part of, part of your workflow, Amazon seam seamlessly gets the language ID from Amazon Comprehend behind the scenes. There's nothing that you need to do on your side. Getting started with Amazon Translate is almost embarrassingly easy. Um, it's available through multiple SDKs, and as we saw in, in Kashif's demo, most implementations require three lines of code, like you see here. Your data is protected by AWS security standards. I think that's almost needless to say. Um, you can use SSL certificates to encrypt the data in transit. Use IAM to control access to your resources. And rest assured that your data is securely stored at AWS. Quickly about pricing. Um, so our standard pricing is $15 per 1 million characters. We also offer a 2 million character monthly free tier for the first 12 months. So you can translate a pretty big amount of content without paying a dime for this. Um, to take you back to that news article that costs $150 to translate with professional localization, in this case, it costs you 7.5 uh, 7 cents. 
Now, a little about what you can expect from us going forward. First, we're investing heavily into getting a lot more training data. And we're experimenting with new approaches uh, for, for architecture every month. Um, so you can really expect the, the translation quality to keep improving. We're also working on launching many more additional languages. Um, in the next few months, you'll see Japanese support, traditional Chinese, Italian, Russian, Turkish, and Czech. And there's really uh, a bunch more, uh, uh, more specific features that I can share with customers that are coming up uh, under NDA. You can get started at aws.amazon.translate uh, slash translate. And shoot me a note if you have any questions. Uh, I'd really like to hear from you. Uh, Ken, Eduardo, and I are also going to stick around after the presentation if you have any immediate questions. And now I'm going to hand it off to Niranjan to talk about Amazon Transcribe. Thanks very much. Thanks, Yoni. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Yoni as well as our customers and partners um, for being here. It's, it's always helpful to not just see the service and what it's intended to do, but also to see how a customer is actually using it and how partners are growing along with it. Right? Uh, one of the challenges with some of these new services is that there's a question about what people can ultimately do with it in the market. And having LineBridge here just helps us see that making these automations possible just widens the scope and the, and the opportunity for us all. So that, that's great, and thank you for doing that with us. So that said, I'm here to talk to you about Amazon Transcribe. And uh, I've also had the courtesy from Tony of being a guest. And so in the last few minutes, you'll get to hear about how Echo 360 is uh, looking at some of these services. But how many of you have heard about Transcribe? Awesome. So you've been paying attention today. Thank you. Um, one of the interesting things uh, about Amazon Transcribe and the need for Amazon Transcribe is this session right here. Right? If you were to listen to this session, you would take so far just about 30 minutes to have digested some of the content that's available to you. If you were to speed up that recording, you could get away with 15 minutes, although you'll hear some squirrels in the background. Um, at the end of it, you're still investing a fair amount of time in trying to figure out what were these guys talking about, right? If you were to take the text from this session, get it, and run it through some kind of an NLP service, like maybe something called Amazon Comprehend, you'd be able to quickly see what was discussed, right? And in terms of the time that, that would take you, it would be minutes at best. It would be seconds, really, right? So this, I think, is the promise of these services when strung together. You can use Amazon Transcribe to unlock the insight, to get real value from audio and video content. You can use Amazon Translate to make those insights, to make that content available to a completely different set of audiences than have been before. Right? Producing that content, the cost of getting that content in front of people is dramatically lowered because of the existence of some of these services. Now, when you take the time and the effort to engage the likes of Lionbridge, yes, you meet that high bar, but you get there so much faster. Right? So essentially what we're saying is you've raised productivity. Right? Now, when would you use Transcribe? Think about things like meetings. Think about sessions like this. Think about broadcast content. Think about social media content, like you saw uh, Kashif's presentation earlier. Right? In all those cases, the ability to string these services together and get meaning out of content is extremely valuable. And that's where the likes of, Tran of Transcribe as well as some of these other services come together. So one of the important things is for you to understand fundamentally where in this stack Amazon Transcribe is positioned. Right. So Amazon Transcribe is a fully managed Continually trained, continuously trained service. What that means to you is that the service will consume both audio as well as video data without a lot of rendering, without a lot of transcoding before you prepare that content, right? We'll talk a little bit more about it. It will take it and it'll produce accurate transcripts that you'll see our time index so that you can get the most out of that transcription process. And it continues to improve over time. The idea is 
that the service essentially learns from the data that it has received so that the improvements are made available to you as users of the service, right? So let's talk about some of these features then, right? You can use both uh, what is sampled at 16K or higher quality data. Uh, this, is, this is what you, for example, use when you're speaking to an Android device or an iOS device or when you're talking to Alexa as an example, right? But you can also use a whole lot more of that 8K or telephony audio, data that has been in call centers and been archived for many, many years. If you had that archive on S3, for example, then you could take that data and run it through Amazon Transcribe for essentially pennies and be able to get a lot of that information. Right? The timestamps and confidence scores tell you where the service knows that it has found something reasonable and where the service believes that it missed something. Right? When two people are speaking to each other, just in a natural context, when, for example, I say, well, the letters are BDA, right? Did I say boy, David, A? Did I say delta, delta, A? It's confusing even to human beings, right? But then there are other gaps, things where there was a blip in the communication, things where there was a scratch, there was a paper being ruffled behind the scenes. Those are the kinds of things that can influence the transcription. And so it's important for the service to share the confidence level, and that way the human in the loop can go focus on the bits that are the most important, right? Let's take a look at these in a little more detail. So we talked a little bit about the fact that it's not just about format A or format B, right? It's here are the most typical formats that are used without having to change that content. It's on S3, just send us a pointer to it, and the service can use it, right? Timestamping and confidence scores, like I said, allow you to see where the service thinks that it can use a human being to help get the accuracy higher, right? I believe that I've understood this correctly. So in this sentence, hi, I'd like to schedule, reschedule my flight to Seattle later tonight. In this case, you're seeing that at this part of the conversation, the term hi was used. At this part of the conversation, the term reschedule was used, right? And what that allows you to see is where in different parts of the conversation certain things are mentioned. So let's take a good example. You only talked about, for example, which, uh, which particular languages Amazon Translate would work with. He mentioned six different language pairs. Imagine if you had to go watch the audio just to find where in that conversation he did that, right? Now imagine for a second that you could just look at the text and quickly do a search right on your browser. The amount of time that it would take you to scan that text is a tenth, perhaps, of the time that it would take you to actually go watch that video again. Now, you would get higher quality output in the sense that you'd get to see the emotion that he expressed when he was thrilled about sharing that. Um, but with a service like Transcribe, what you can do is you can get the best of both worlds. Where did they explain in Game of Thrones this particular sequence, right? The etymology of this stuff is explained right there. Well, can you just send me a link to it? Well, now you can, right? Where was this translation provided? Where was this term found? Where in this meeting did we discuss items A, B, and C? Now I can go do a search, right? Those are the kinds of things that this enables. Punctuation, it's not just for grandmas. Uh, it's really important to be able to read text, and it's not just from a comfort level, but actually to be able to understand that text. Right? So let's read these two as examples. Please extrapolate the projections based on market growth and segment share. Can you email to me once you're done? Right? Somewhere in there, we know that there's a request. We, we know as human beings that there is some punctuation missing. But it would take you a couple of, of seconds at the minimum to be able to discover those punctuations. Now what the service can do is it can break that out and split the two into please extrapolate the projections based on market growth and segment share. Can you email it to me once you're done? Right? It's a very clean request. And anybody who reads that should be able to see that there's a request to do something and then email results when you're done. Now, this is even harder when the request is, in fact, being sent to another service, another machine. Right? Because remember that what Amazon Transcribe is doing is it's allowing you to get text from audio and video data. What you do with that text is things like translation, 
And so with translation, you need to think about if the input or the source is not very good, then the output will not be very good either, right? And equally, if you think about services like Comprehend, right, or natural language processing in general, or for example, services like Lex, imagine if this was being sent to a bot to say, hey bot, when you're done with this, can you do this other thing for me? Well, that would be very hard for a bot to decipher, right? So this is where punctuation is extremely important. The notion of speaker attribution, when three people are speaking in a conversation, when 10 people are speaking in a meeting, it's really important to be able to attribute the, the speech to the particular person. So you could see these three sentences, we are speaking with a customer tomorrow, what's our plan for the meeting? I have it covered as one big blob of text. Or you could see that you know, speaker one, for example, said, we're speaking with a customer tomorrow, somebody else piped up, what's our plan for the meeting? And somebody else says, I have it covered. Now we all know from being in meetings like this that the person who said, I have it covered, is the person who gets tagged for it. So it's really important to find out who said that, right? The other thing that we can do is custom vocabulary, right? Now this is a new feature, it's a really cool part of the service, and I have to tell you, working with some of the um, customers who work with, we won't call it jargon, but it's specialized language, right? This is a really important aspect. Customers who use brand names, uh, customers who, for example, use technical terminology that is special to either the industry or, for example, to their particular use case, right? Those customers find it really helpful to be able to provide those terms. And then behind the scenes, what the service does is it uses those extra phrases to be able to add um, auxiliary models so that what the service does generally is enhanced by the custom layer that you've provided. So as an example, let's say that Amazon Transcribe is out and it does not know how to handle the utterance myocardial infarction, right? Well, you provide it some additional data. That data is used to additionally train the models. And then your particular instance, when you run that transcription job, can use these additional terms to be able to discover what was being said with the rest of the accuracy intact, right? Security is job one at AWS, and we've heard job zero often, right? Uh, what we're talking about in this particular case is the security not just of your data in transit, at rest, but also of your use of the service, right? If you think about the fact that somebody hitting Amazon Translate or somebody hitting Amazon Transcribe under your account is essentially a billable event to that AWS account, you'd like to ensure that that data has been emitted with the right auspices as well as is charged for the right account. So as before, SSL, just to encrypt the content, uh, the endpoints are all SSL for all AWS services today. But then the other thing that you also see is the use of um, IAM and SIGV4 signing. What that does is encrypts the data upon uh, between the two endpoints, and it also prevents, for example, replay attacks, right? Um, you're also seeing uh, signed URLs for transcripts. So, for example, yes, the job is kicked off. Yes, it takes a few minutes to get done. When that transcription is available, who should be able to get to the data, right? That isn't a free-for-all. You'd like to limit that to a subset of people who have the right access, right? So what does a typical integration look like? There's an audio integration, right? There's some kind of audio input that data is collected somewhere. And if you're lucky, it starts off on S3 using either Kinesis or the likes, right? Now, I say audio here, but it could be audio, it could be video as well. Uh, some kind of Lambda or related function kicks off an Amazon Transcribe job. It waits on that job to finish when that job is done. You then do some post-processing. Now, that post-processing might be enrichment in the sense you might say, I know these other facts that I want to bring into this. I know that uh, with, this, with this particular audience, there's this Q&A set that was also made available. So from this analyst earnings call, I already have the manual, the manual transcription of the Q&A session, of the analyst discussion. So I'd just like to add that and then run Comprehend on all of it together, right? So it's a really important aspect to be able to put these things together from different data sources, and then to be able to make them available for historical analysis, right? 
So this is where the data that's in transcribed just from this one MP4, MP3 file gets augmented with volumes of other information that you have and then goes on to enrich the existing data set that you own, right? So that's the important aspect there. And then using services like Amazon Athena for being able to rummage through a lot of this data to bring out those results for you, as well as Redshift for long-term data warehousing, or for example, Amazon QuickSight for being able to quickly visualize this information. So one of the things that'd be really cool is to hear, for example, if you were looking at 1,000 recordings of a uh, call center, right? Uh, imagine that you had a credit card operations and you were just trying to find out how many times do people call to report fraud, right? That's a, that's a typical challenge. And today the way that that would be done is you'd either have an off-the-shelf solution or, for example, you'd have been recording these tickets as they came in anyway, right? But without something along those lines, what you're trying to do is you're trying to say, if I can ask these questions informally, then what I've allowed my business teams to do is to ad hoc come up with projects for us, is to ad hoc ask questions about what we can do to improve the customer experience, right? So in that kind of a use case, uh, what you would do is you'd transcribe uh, the eight kilohertz or telephony audio, you'd get the, the accuracy that you anticipate, and you'd get the text uh, into a data set that you can work with, with Amazon Comprehend or the likes of Comprehend, and then you'd visualize the results with QuickSight, right? It's a pretty typical thing. I've actually seen a number of customers already do this and be quite successful. Uh, if you think about this other use case where I've got video content, right? And I'd just like to make that content available in Portuguese. I'd like to make that content available in Spanish, as an example. Now this is something that is really easy to do surprisingly easy to do with these services. Here's how you do it. You'd get the video content, you'd run that through Transcribe, you'd get the raw, so the raw output from Transcribe is JSON documents, right? And those JSON documents, as I said before, are speaker, uh, have speaker labels for attribution of the speakers. They also have every word uh, timestamped with a confidence score. Then you can take that content, uh, take those sentence segments, run them through Transcribe. And then you've got a collection of these sentences that essentially make up the score, the transcript. Once you've got that, then you can uh, reformat that data. It's a pretty simple operation to get into web VTT or a similar subtitle form. And now once you've done that in say six or eight different languages, then you can simply host that content using either CloudFront or S3 or Elemental or one of the others that are supported in AWS to be able to all of a sudden take content that came in in language A and make it available in several other languages with a short and automated workflow and process, right? What about meetings, right? You only signed up to say he had this thing covered and we wanna make sure that we've attributed that to him. Um, the way that's typically done is, as before, the recordings come in, we transcribe those recordings, we index that text using Amazon Elasticsearch in this case, and then we have an API that runs through that, right? And then you can answer questions like, who said that we'd be able to get this done by the 20th? Who said that we were ready to do this? Well, now you have at least well, part of the conversation it was said in the specific language that was used, right? Then the other the question that often comes up is, all right, now that you've got that, can we identify if there are other things about this meeting, right? Can we identify at this project that, for example, ran for six months, when the team started to question whether they would be able to make it on time, right? Now, if you think about the typical Scrum session, this is hard to imagine. But take a second to think about those people who've built structures, buildings, right? Uh, in those use cases, there's a project that has a longer life. And in those cases, there is a sense on the pulse of that team, right? How does the team feel? And I'm not saying that you can identify the specific feelings, but what you can identify is the tone of the conversation, right? You can use sentiment detection to say, how many sentences in this transcript seem to sound positive versus negative? You can have a sense of the kind of meeting that you just had with your customers as well, right? So how does this work? Behind the scenes, the audio that comes in 
goes through a pre-processing layer to make it available to deep learning models that, as I said before, are continuously trained, right? So it's not important where these models are today. What's really important is to accept the fact that they will continue to improve from wherever they are, right? Because many people have access to open source software and similar software that is today doing some of these things. But who will continue to maintain it? And who will continue to maintain it with the specific terms, for example, that you might want to use? That's where the likes of Transcribe come in. So after that process of going through the speech recognition, there's a post-processing, right? That post-processing is what enriches this, makes some corrections, for example, provides some of the timestamps, et cetera. Now, that's not where you have to stop, right? Because one of the important things is that the service might stop there, but you generally know more about your data than a, than a service that was designed for general use does, right? So this is where it's important to use some of the existing data and be able to augment what comes out of the service to then say, what I got is a raw JSON file, but I'm, what I'm making out of it is a set of annotated subtitles. What I'm making out of it is an annotated transcript with links to parts of my documentation that others can actually use, right? So let's look at some of the challenges here, right? This is a great room. You guys have been quiet. You're actually listening, which is pretty awesome, so thank you for that. But that's not the way life works, right? Um, life is you sitting in a restaurant placing an order. Life is the person who called you to complain about the fact that uh, the alarm doesn't turn off, uh, has an alarm in the background. Um, so ambient noise is a challenge, right? Uh, conversational artifacts, things that come with compression, especially uh, telephony audio has uh, this sort of tinny or whiny metallic noise to it because it's heavily compressed data. You're taking something that is you know, collected uh, with something like 32K, and it is sampled all the way down to something like 8K, right? Uh, and that's if you're lucky. Uh, good audio streams generally have something like 10 to 12K worth of data. Um, and if you recall, with telephony, we actually sample telephony at a much lower rate so that we can support uh, the compression that we'd like, right? Uh, crosstalk. People, for some reason, feel like they can talk over each other, um, and they don't realize that there's a bot listening to them. No. Um, <laughs> what should really happen is... You know, life, life doesn't consist of people speaking distinct sentences, right? We'd love that, but that's not how life works. So that's another challenge. Uh, code switching. People uh, speak in different tones when they speak about things, and they also switch language when they're doing that, right? Uh, if, you've, if you've ever worked across functions, that's something that you're very familiar with. But what I'd love to be able to do is uh, to show you a little more about this uh, in the sense that a, a transcript that could then uh, show you how a high accuracy transcript could get augmented with entity detection as well as with key phrases and sentiment to say, hey, here's somebody who's really happy with this upgrade that we provided. Here's how you could go about using it. Uh, go to the console. Uh, you could also use the command line, which we highly recommend because it's faster. Um, pricing, it's, well, if you do the math on that, you'll see that, and we have some examples on the pricing page, you'll see that just about an hour worth of uh, video will cost you something like $1.44. There's a generous free tier for you to start with, so if you're playing with a service, you shouldn't see a bill for that. And how do you get started? Well, amazon.com slash transcribe. So what I'd love to do is to get Tony on to talk a little bit about how they were able to use the service, and we Thank you, Tony. Is this working? Oh. Do you have the clicker? Yes, sir. Awesome. What, you want the clicker too now? <laughs> Multitasking. I'm Italian. I speak with my hands. Um, change that. Uh, f first, I'm Tony Abadi. I'm the founder of Echo360. It's a 10-year-old software company that sells to colleges globally. So we're really basically a, a learning platform, and we're really, really excited about this basic feature because it's really going to change the paradigm for not only students but teachers, and we really believe it's going to improve outcomes in higher ed, which is pretty important to us. Uh, what the solution does today, before we get to the specifics on how Transcribe is going to supercharge this, 
is it's effectively a learning platform students use before, during, and after class. So it allows you to do a bunch of things. One, you can review the material uh, projected to you before class in video format, audio format, or PDF. Um, it also provides you a ton of tools that you can use with that content before class, during class, and after class. For example, you can take notes in our system, and I'll talk about why that's important in a second. Uh, you can also ask questions of your peers. You can ask questions of the TA. You can ask questions of the teacher on the fly with the system. Right? You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to scramble to the podium after class. You don't have to go to teacher's hours. When you have the question at the moment in time, you can type the question and typically get an answer back much faster this way. Um, the third thing it allows teachers to do is to actually poll or quiz students. So there's an interactive component to this too, which drives uh, greater student engagement. This is just an example of a class. I'll use this uh, particular class throughout the presentation. It's actually a professor at the University of Michigan who works with us. He is an extreme weather guy. He actually chases tornadoes, if you can believe it. So he has a pretty interesting, if not dangerous, job. And he uses this to teach his class and has been using it for quite some time. Um, what you see effectively in the pane here is the Q&A window when a student wants to ask a question about some complex subject just presented. Right? So you can use this. Again, like I said, before class, you can use it in class, and you can, of course, use it after class. This also renders on your mobile device, so you don't have to do this with a PC. So that's a quick overview of what, what Echo does. Uh, why is it important? Even before we add transcription, um, we have proven time and time again that when students use the solution, they get better grades. Now, this is a correlation. It's not causation. You can never truly prove causation. But this is actually a fairly sophisticated medical school example across two different courses where they tested the level of effort uh, that students were exercising the tool and or the instructor was using the polling application of the tool. And you can see the more it's used, your grades go up demonstrably. So kids typically who fail or withdraw stay in the class. Kids who get Ds typically get Cs or C pluses and all the way up. So it's a pretty powerful tool as it exists today. So let's talk a little bit about how Transcribe is going to help. As mentioned previously, we are recording about a million hours of fresh learning content a year across our 250 customers in 30 countries. We're supporting about 2 million students now. So a lot of that video is just basically going into a library and students are having to try and find things within a lecture. It turns out lectures are now running anywhere from as short as 45 minutes to upwards of three hours. So you get a three hour lecture and a video and yes, in our system you can play it back at twice the speed it's very hard to find what you need within the video, right? Unless you've been very good at diligently while you're listening to the lecture live, bookmarking key areas and taking key notes. So what we're effectively gonna do, and we're gonna do this for free to a certain level uh, for most schools and then they can buy extra, is we're gonna take that million hours of content and transcribe it so that you literally have a full-blown transcript of uh, what was spoken in the class after class and we're going to present it to you in a window, like the question window or the notes window. So why is this very helpful to the student? It's actually a bunch of things. First, we are taking the most advanced transcription engine that we have found, and we have tested a bunch in the market. And we believe even with the complexity of the language being used in STEM classes or in medical school where they have their own lingo and they have their own um, acronyms, we typically get between 88 and 94 percent accuracy before we can seed the engine with keywords, right? So we believe that that uh, um, accuracy is going to go up. The second is we're fully integrating the suite into the other tools that already existed. So imagine a student in class, or more importantly after class in this case, toggling between their notes pane, the transcription pane, and the Q&A pane, right? Well, the first thing the student typically does, and we've done this with a few, is they don't take as many notes, and they spend more time actually trying to engage in the content and learn. They're not trying to be the court stenographer in the classroom and take down everything the professor said. Why? Because they know it's going to be there for them by us, right? So now they can actually, actually try and learn the material as opposed to write really, really fast, and so they don't focus on that. The second thing it does is it allows them to find things. So over the course of several courses that you take in a semester, you could have upwards of 300 or 400 videos that you're responsible for trying to internalize before a final exam you're taking four courses a semester, which is typical in North America. This allows you to use keyword search to find key concepts that you want to basically review before the exam across all the files in your library, and then ultimately within a file. 
So again, if you have a three-hour lecture and you're trying to find Bernoulli's principle in it, this thing is going to tell you specifically in what minute and second across that three-hour video that phrase is used. And then when you slave to it, what's interesting is you go to that, let's assume it's at 45 minutes in an hour and a half or two-hour long lecture, up pops the video, the audio, the transcript, and your notes in any question and answer session that took place amongst all the students in the class right there at your fingertips. Right? So you don't have to go searching through your, hard, uh, your handwritten notes. You don't have to go through a different Q&A threads in some other system. Everything's sitting there for you to internalize. And that's the reason why you see students' outcomes improving over time. Right? So the other thing I would like to highlight is one of the key elements in higher ed is the notion that you need to have closed captioning for the hearing impaired. This is an ADA requirement. It's a legal requirement. The challenge here is it has to be 99% accurate or it does not qualify. And we are actually putting the transcription pane in the transcription window to the right, not the closed captioning window at the bottom here, because of that accuracy issue. It's against the law for us to put the transcript in that lower box until it's 99% accurate. Before you had this solution, schools would have to literally pay a human translator upwards of $60 an hour to do the transcription. So do the math. We're doing a million hours a year times 60 is $60 million if you were going to do a closed captioning for every audio and video we capture. It's untenable. Schools will not do this. So typically our schools, before this solution was available, would they would find the classes where they had a specific student that had the accommodation requirement. They raised their hand and said, I am hearing impaired. Please do this for me. And we typically see, depending upon the school, less than 5% of all of the video and audio transcribed the old-fashioned way because it is so expensive, right? But by providing this tool at, like I said, upwards of 90% accurate, ideally it would rise a bit with um, machine learning and seeding it with keywords, then what you can do is have work-study students, much in the example we saw before, moving it from the 93, 94% accurate to the 99% accurate. Once it achieves that threshold, it can be put in the closed captioning window here, and that's something we do automatically. We've been doing that for years. So this is going to be a huge, huge tool for all schools to effectively close caption everything once they've cracked the accuracy code. Because we're not doing this at $60 an hour, I can pr promise you. Right? So, um, oh, I went the wrong way, excuse me. So again, just to summarize, the key thing here in all of this is we're driving student engagement. And I love this quote, you know, tell me and I forget, teach me and I learn, involve me and I, excuse me, teach me and I remember and involve me and I learn, um, what we see students doing with this platform to include with the transcription piece is they use the solution time and time again. It becomes almost a crutch for them so that they can spend more time learning in class and then obviously using the tool to, to effectively really master key concepts after class. And so um, with the uh, partnership with Amazon and with the transcription capability, we're, we're highly confident that this is really even going to drive this even further. And with that, I think they asked me to encourage you all to please fill out the survey at the end of the session. Any questions? Thanks. Thanks.